Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we have almost full room, which I'm glad to see. Uh, before we will dive into the into the presentation, I would like to see you know uh, how is the audience familiar with all the different technologies that we are going to talk about. So just a quick question. Let's do a poll. Uh, who knows is familiar with the relational databases? You know, use them. Cool. So some guys are a little sleeping or not putting their hands up. So. Um, how many of you are actually using uh, relational databases in a production environment as a part of a you know uh, workflows that are based on your business? Interesting. More people is using the production the databases in a production environment than using the databases at all. Interesting diff. Uh, last question for a relational database is how many of you are using more than one vendor in a production environment? You know. Um, considerably less, let's say like 10% of the room. Okay, um, so that you know has been databases. Now let's move to a, uh, to a Hadoop, a Hadoop war. Who here is familiar with Hadoop or you know heard the keyword before? Almost everyone, I'm excited actually. Um, and who here uses Hadoop in a production environment? Wow, almost everyone. Guys, I like you. <laughs> And now coming to you know scoop right, um, more than half of the room is using databases in a production environment. More than half of the room is using Hadoop in a production environment. So who already is using scoop in a production environment? One single guys, come on, what are you doing? How are you transferring the data? Well, I guess that's why you are here, right? After all. Okay, so uh, the pilots of today's session uh, is Abraham El Marek. Uh, he's my very good friend and colleague back at Cloudera. Uh, he's a core Hue engineer and also a very, very frequent contributor to Scoop. And uh, also uh, Jarek Jartsets Czech, my friend Jartsets. Um, he is the co-author of the Scoop cookbook, as well as a PMC member and committer on several Hadoop, excuse me, several projects in Apache. So uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of a, a little bit of history. So. Uh, before Hadoop, uh, there were database systems, uh, data systems, if you will, that uh, did one job and that one, that one job very well. It stored data. You basically had all of your data in these data systems, and then you had a compute system uh, somewhere else. And maybe you transferred that data from the data system to the compute systems via network attached storage or something. And so this worked pretty well. Um, and what was found was, uh, for these systems, a lot of them required specific hardware. That specific hardware uh, was generally very, 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 very large. And if you wanted to actually scale, you had to scale vertically. This meant get larger boxes. And so Hadoop came along and changed things up a little bit. So Hadoop actually took um, computation to the data. Rather than uh, moving the data from computation, Hadoop took moving computation to data. That was really big. Also, it didn't require any special hardware. It could use just your generic PC, any commodity hardware. That was also very big. Scaling was built into the system. So instead of having to worry about partitioning or scaling vertically, it actually took care of it for you. It was a forethought rather than an afterthought. So the way you do this is horizontally. It applies horizontal scaling. All you have to do is add an entirely new node, and you're scaled. So was Hadoop the first to do horizontal scaling? No, but it does a pretty good job. <clears throat> so who were the early adopters of Hadoop? Well, excuse me, the early adopters of Hadoop, how, uh, what, what problems did they have? So they had you know, a Hadoop cluster lying around with a lot of resources, and then they had these data systems in their data warehouse that had all of the data but no resources. So the problem was, how do you move that data to Hadoop? And so there were a couple of you know, custom solutions out there. Um, uh, generally speaking, these, uh, these companies that had these problems, they would build their own stuff. Uh, you know, it would be very specific. They'd have like MySQL dump or something. They'd dump it, uh, they'd dump it into Hadoop. You know? But then there were a lot of problems with that. Uh, Hadoop has uh, a variety of different components, uh, Hive, HBase, et cetera. You might want to represent that data in a different way, you know, Avro, se Avro sequence file, something of that nature. And that didn't, that didn't really, you know, uh, 
really, really help or didn't really do it for them, right? If they wanted to do that or do it themselves, it was a, a lot of work. That's a problem. And then on top of that, you may have multiple database systems. And doing that for every database system is, on top of that, also a lot of work. And then, you know, there's the problem of monitoring and potentially you have other guarantees and things of that nature. It's just a lot of work. Um, <clears throat> and so that's where Scoop came in. So Scoop is the one tool to rule them all. If you can imagine it uh, in a database agnostic fashion, will connect to any database that you can think of, any relational database that you can think of, and then enable you to transfer data into Hadoop. Also, it integrates with all of the uh, Hadoop uh, components or the majority of the Hadoop components, such as HBase and Hive. Um, and also, if you just want to like transfer data to, to HDFS, you, you can choose sequence files or Avro files or just plain text files, et cetera, et cetera. So, who here is familiar with hackathons? Cool, just about everyone. So, Scoop was actually a hackathon project uh, from a former Cloudera member, uh, Aaron Kimball. Uh, that's how it started off. And so, really, uh, Scoop had uh, a couple of goals in mind when uh, Aaron Kimball was building this. Um, it was for one-time transfers. You have a bunch of data in your relational database systems and you just want to transfer that data to Hadoop one time. Then you, you know, wait around a week, two weeks, maybe a month. Don't use Scoop, and then you do it again. Um, also, you know, you had to be a super user to do this kind of thing. So fast forward to the future, or excuse me, fast forward to the present, and you know, there's a, co a couple of new wor uh, workflows out there that we need to support. Um, you know, you've, you've imported all of your data, and then you've waited like a week or two, and then you have more data in your relational, uh, relational database system, and so you want to import the rest of that data rather than duplicate that data. In the Scoop world, we call that an incremental import. And then on top of that, you know, we needed to provide Scoop as a service. We're finding that uh, companies uh, actually have uh, a division of uh, roles, division of responsibilities, things of that nature. So database administrators, Hadoop administrators, the common user, they all do slightly different things. Potentially a database administrator would manage how you connect to these database systems. And then the common user would define from where you're transferring data and then from, uh, to where you're transferring data to. So it required a couple of massive changes to do that. Uh, we've investigated, uh, the, uh, the Scoop community has investigated improving Scoop 1. Turns out it requires a couple of radical changes. Uh, so they decided to start from the ground up. And that is Scoop 2. It was designed with through, uh, three new main objectives, which is ease of use, uh, basically having a very simple client and representing objects in the database. Um, ease of security, which is basically having roles that are clearly defined, such as your database admi administrators, your Hadoop, Hadoop administrators, and common users. Um, also, ease of extensibility, which is basically having a very clearly defined interface for your connectors. So the connectors in Scoop 1, by the way, they did just about everything. In Scoop 2, that's no longer the case. Really, all the connectors are responsible for in Scoop 2 is fetching and storing data from the databases and uh, transforming them to the intermediate data format, which is the representation the data takes, uh, uh, takes the form of while it goes through the system. And for the rest of the technical details, I'm going to pass the torch to Yartsets. So uh, the way we structure the presentation, uh, I will continue, uh, you know, describing how Scoop works, how Scoop 2 works. I will start, you know, at 10,000 feet and we will, you know, continue landing all the way down. So on really high level, you know, how Scoop, does, uh, Scoop 2 works. Well, you have a server client model, right? You can see server and clients everywhere. So I'm assuming that you're not surprised. Uh, the server is doing all the heavy lifting. Um, Whereas the client is very light, uh, very light base. Um, what we've uh, noticed on the original Scoop 1 that we've mentioned, and the one user that before you know raised the hand that is already using Scoop 1 in production, the Scoop 1 is a very thick client. When you run Scoop, 
one, you need to access to the Hadoop, uh, to your Hadoop cluster. You need to have access to your database directly from the node that is executing SKU. So uh, when you think about, you know, uh, how would you actually use it in a production, right? You're a user. You might be working from home over a VPN, but you need direct connectivity to the database. Well, that is a security concern, right? You don't want to expose all your databases over the VPN. So what we did in Scoop 2, the client is very, very lightweight. All it does, it just contains to the server over VPN. And then it's the server job to connect to the databases, to the Hadoop cluster, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, I would say, most important portion of this picture uh, is the data flow. Um, the scoop server drives the entire process, right? It will say, now is the time to transfer the data. Let's do it. But the data themselves are not going through the server, right? Because there is just one server. So uh, that would be like a bottleneck of the entire transfer. Um, Instead, all the data are coming directly between the uh, database and the Hadoop cluster. Make sense? Go. Cool. So we have been on 10,000 feet, you know, server client model, very simple. Now we are going to land a little bit more, 5,000 feet. Uh, as you can imagine, the scoop server have a lot of different components. Uh, don't you know, even try to read the picture. That's just you know, an understanding of the high level. We will actually dive into all the components and describe how they are working and interacting with each other. The first component that I want to mention is a connector. Uh, but before we will dive into uh, how it's you know, in the bigger picture, let's just stop and talk what, is, what it is actually, what it represents. Um, Abe mentioned that the power of Scoop is that there is one tool to rule them all, right? With one tool, you can transfer data from any database in the world to your Hadoop cluster. Well, that seems like a magic, right? That disappeared 300 years ago from this world. There is no such thing as, you know, one magical tool that can do everything, right? You would call a BS on me. The way Scoop actually achieved this functionality is through a pluggable interface called Connector. And each connector is responsible to talk to one database. So we have a MySQL connector, we have an Oracle connector, we have a Teradata connector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how Scoop has the power to, uh, to, to you know, talk with all the, all the databases. The <clears throat> In Scoop 1, we had also a you know, concept of a connector, um, but at that time, the connectors were male. Yeah, a hacky thing, how to do it. Yes, you have a connector, but they were very big, very fat, doing a lot of things, and well, it wasn't working very well. Uh, so in scoop two, what we, you know, uh, what we did was, hey, connector, very small thing. Uh, all you're responsible for is just to get me the data or just to get the data to database, nothing else. Everything else is my responsibility. Um, now, when we've defined the connectors, uh, let's move to the additional component, so-called repository. Mm, uh, when I've mentioned that you know, we have a different connectors for different databases, it's probably not hard to imagine that the different connectors, different databases, have a different requirements, what they need in order to transfer the data, right? The basic example, I have a generic JDBC connector. All I know is a JDBC interface. And in order to do so, I need JDBC URL, some credentials, perhaps some uh, connection properties. Uh, with saying um, I'm using SSL and I'm using you know some encryption or how the hell I actually can get to the database. So the connector itself, you know, a Java code piece of a piece of a code, a plugin, is exposing what it needs in order to do its job. Uh, all those metadata parameters are actually stored in Scoop2. We have a you know, repository where we can put additional, additional objects. Um, in Scoop1, we had, a, we had the you know, concept of a, uh, of a connector. We had the concept of parameters, but we have like gazillion of them. Uh, so you know, my colleague of mine actually mentioned that uh, Scoop1 have a parameter hell because you had like, you know, 69, I believe, last time. Uh, different parameters where parameter A might not work with parameter B, that will not work with parameter C, considering that you're using connector A and blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, the reason why we had this parameter hell was that the parameters were exposed by the scoop framework. Scoop said, hey, I need all this information. Then the parameters were passed to the connector and it was up to the connector what to do with them. In scoop two, we've reversed this process. It's a connector who is saying, hey, I need those parameters in order to run. Now, uh, all those parameters have two different families or two different sets. You can, uh, you can think about it this way. The first set is actually changing a lot, whereas the second set is not changing at all or almost. So we've promoted and created two high-level object, objects. The first object is something that we are calling a connection. Please do not think about it as a, you know, actual TCP connection to some server. It's just a set of metadata, you know, a hash table somewhere in memory saying for this key, JDBC URL, I have this value, JDBC semicolon, blah, 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 blah. The logical representation of a connection is how to get to that source, to that database, to that FTP server, to that mainframe. The intention is that you will have one connection object per physical server, per physical database that will be created by some DB administrators and maintained by them. The second high level object more meant for, uh, for a user rather than administrators is called a job. And it contains a set of parameters. Again, you know, it's the same metadata object, a hash table, that are more meant what I want to do with the database box. So for example, I have a table. What table I want to import? Uh, what is the target system? Is it Hive? Is it HBase? Is it HCatalog? Is it, you know, name your own thing. And uh, all those objects are represented and stored in a repository so that you can query them, you can change them, you can delete them, etc., etc. Up until this point, I was just talking about very fancy, you know, way how to enter parameters, right? Yes, I can store them in a database. Yoo-hoo, everybody's doing that, right? Up until this point, we did not do any transformation, sorry, uh, any transfers of data. We we're just representing metadata somewhere. Um, and that is, again, uh, something that we learned from our users. Uh, in scoop one, um, you know, I mentioned that originally it was meant as I will transfer data once, that I will wait, you know, a month here and do it again. But the users iterated to a solution where they needed to do the transfers daily, right? I mean, Hadoop has become from a more a data warehouse active archive system to a thing of a daily use, right? I'm I'm transferring the data daily, I'm doing computation. My business depends on it. So uh, what we've seen was that the user had a long scoop command, you know, seven lines of bash, and they copy and paste this command all over again and then hit enter to execute it. Change one line, one letter, ping, execute it again. Very troublesome process, right? So what we did in scoop two, we said, let's distinguish between I am changing a metadata and I'm running the transfer. And that is represented by the submission object on the slide. Uh, all, you know, creating a job. Again, don't imagine that something is running anywhere. It's just a set of parameters and I have a different command. Hey, now is the time to do the transfer. And a submission object will get created. Uh, the way you can think about the submission is just, you know, uh, I've executed the job yesterday night, it finished yesterday midnight, I've transferred 3 million rows in 15 minutes. That doesn't do the math, but you see the point. So uh, we describe what is a connector, general interface for a particular database, uh, users is creating all the various metadata stored in repository, and now we can say that server is everything that I've just described. Uh, the purpose of server uh, is two, two main purposes. The first one, obviously, is the CRUD uh, logic on top of the metadata, right? You need to create those objects. You need to update them. You need to delete them. The second portion uh, is to drive the transfers, right? I've mentioned before, we've separated the execution from giving the actual parameters. So run the job is the second important portion. The way we've designed the system uh, intentionally, uh, when you will say, hey, Scoop2Server, please transfer this table, 
to do HDFS. The script to server we see, okay, hmm, let's do it. And we'll create a jo job, you know. S this time it's actually not the, you know, object that I described before. It's really something that will execute on some cluster and it will submit it to a remote cluster. At that point, uh, scoop 2 server will stop driving it and just checking how it does. The, uh, again, the way to think about it, I've submitted a job and I'm just uh, checking. Hey, did you finish? No? Okay, continue running. Did you finish? You failed. Oh, too bad. Why? Um, so uh, the benefit of that architecture is if you will put scoop server down while jobs are running, everything will continue running, right? Because the jobs are uh, self-sufficient. The scoop to server is just overseeing it. So it's not a single point of failure, right? If that dies, everything runs. You cannot run new jobs, yeah, for the bummer, but at least the existing ones are still running. So now we have been at 5,000 uh, feet. We've described all the server architecture, and now we're going to land. Now we are going to transfer the data. Um, again, a lesson that we learned from our own history when working on Scoop 1. Uh, in Scoop 1, it was like, yeah, please transfer the data, do it whatever means necessary, it will somehow work. Well, it didn't. Uh, it had a lot of short bags, a, a lot of uh, KV heads, a lot of things weren't working together. Uh, half of our connectors in Scoop 1 have, no, actually, up until this day, don't support HBase because we have to do it explicitly, and a lot of, a lot of hiccups. So uh, in order to avoid that, uh, in Scoop 2, we've defined a workflow. Every single job that is transferring data has a predefined workflow, a set of actions that needs to happen in the, in the order. Um, what is also important is that uh, for each portion, a different part is responsible for. So let's take an uh, example of an import job because you know that's the simplest way. Uh, I have a remote database and I have a table there, let's say credit card data, and then I have a Hadoop HDFS file. My goal, get that credit card data to the HDFS. Um, the first step, well, is initialization, right? Not a big deal. I mean, let's, we are all here developers, right? So we, I need to initialize something. Uh, the first important portion is a partitioner, right? I have one table, it's a huge thing, and I want to transfer it in a parallel. So I need somehow slice it up into independent pieces so that they can be transferred in parallel. And that's the job of a partitioner. Basically, it's slicing data. When I slice the entire table, now I can you know, see, hey, test now the point when I can transfer them. And I will create a multiple extractor things, multiple extractor, well, object or tasks. Every extractor or each extractor will get one partition from the previous phase and do the data transfers. The important thing here that I am transferring data to scoop framework. I am not at this point storing them anywhere. And that's all that connector does. The connector will partition the table and get the data uh, to the scoop framework in the extractor. From now on, it's the job of the framework to finish uh, the data, data transfer. Uh, the framework will submit a piece called a loader that will load all the data to the final destination, in this case, HDFS. And finally, I have some destroyer that will you know, finish everything, clean up, perhaps a temporary tables, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you do the step back and look at it, you see a basic of a usual ETL system, right? I have an extractor, I have a transfer phase, and I have a loader. In this case, there is no transformation phase, right? So it's a sort of a, of a EL system. Um, however, however, we are planning to add a small transformation phase here. Um, so that you know the scoop can be used uh, for a single ETL processing, not just for an EL. But you know, right now, just just EL. So uh, I will do a small pause, and I will be talking about something completely different because you know I want to confuse all of you. Um, and I will go back to my <laughs> uh, to my uh, polling polling system uh, before I ask. Who in the room knows Hadoop? And basically everyone put their hands up. So who in the room knows how MapReduce works? You know, what is a mapper, what is a reducer? Almost everyone in the room, cool. 
how many of you wrote a SMA produced job in their life? At least one majority of the room. So uh, what I'm going to say, not a big surprise, but I will repeat it anyway. Uh, my produced job, the way you can think about it is that it consists from four different steps. You have an input format that will say, hey, I have a directory with all the files that I need to process. I will split it uh, per input blocks. For every single block, I will call the second stage, which is a mapper. I will run several mappers. They will do some data computation. Then I will have a reduce phase where I will do some aggregation of the data generated in mappers. And finally, using an output format, I will you know, put the data back to HDFS, store them somewhere. Now, when you take a look at you know, the workflow that we define here uh, with the MapReduce one-on-one, -on -one, you can immediately imagine, hey, that seems like the same thing, right? I can basically take the workflow and put it to the MapReduce and voila, everything will be working. And indeed, that's exactly what we've done. Uh, we've defined a, you know, a generic workflow and applied the MapReduce. Uh, now you might be asking, why bother doing that, right? Why am I bothering to do some abstraction when the abstraction is already there, I'm actually using it? Uh, the answer to that is actually very, uh, very interesting. What we see right now is that MapReduce is really heavily used. So Scoop2 is using MapReduce to do the data transfers. But looking you know, into the future, uh, there is much more different projects that are trying to do the same jobs just differently. Uh, there is a Spark, there is a Yarn, there is a Test. And all those things are using the same things, you know, trans, uh, execute, I would say, an execution engines on top of a Hadoop. They are doing the job differently, right? So what we didn't want to do is tie ourselves to a MapReduce when, you know, a year from now, the users can say, hey, you know, Scoop is the only thing that is using MapReduce. Why are you even bother, you know, using it? Can you just rewrite it for me? But at that point, it would have been, yeah, we are using it so deeply, so it's not so easy, you know? Uh, so that is the reason why you have an abstract workflow and the application, the execution layer is just a pluggable piece, another plugin. I can just say run on MapReduce, run on Spark, run on Yarn, run on Test. And that's why we have the, uh, we have the separation. So now we've transferred all the data to HDFS, so we've succeeded, right? The last piece that we want to describe uh, is the client interface, right? Or spend a couple of words there. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the client, as I've mentioned, is very thin. Uh, the server exposes a REST interface. You will just say, hey, HTTP, get me the connector data. You will get back a JSON object representing the connector. Or, hey, submit a job. You will do a post request to some URL. And voila, job will be spawned. And that's it. Nothing more. The client is not connecting to the database. It's not connecting to the MapReduce, uh, to the Hadoop. All it does is just talk to a you know HTTP port. Um, and uh, we have two clients right now that are using this interface. Uh, we have a built-in shell uh, based on Groovy, uh, where you will you know type all the commands in the command line. It's actually very similar to the Scoop one. You know by using different parameters, you will change different objects. And then we have a very, very cool web interface in the Hue project that Abe will describe further. <clears throat> Thanks, Ritzet. So uh, we have a, uh, <clears throat> a Scoop2 UI in Hue. So quick question, has anyone here heard of Hue? Cool, some people. So uh, to give a brief overview of Hue, Hue is the Hadoop user experience. It's a UI for uh, Hadoop, but really anything big data. So it comes, it comes with uh, UIs for components like Hive, Impala, HDFS, et cetera, et cetera. Really anything big data it has a, it has a UI for. And so the goal of Hue is to provide an integrated experience. And this project, Hue, really wouldn't have been, really wouldn't be complete without Scoop, if you think about it. You need a way to get your data into Hadoop such that you can perform transformations and data computations, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at the screen, you'll see uh, basically the job listings page from Hue uh, of Scoop2. And so if you look at the top right, you'll see manage connections and jobs. Essentially, it allows you to create connections and create jobs. Uh, pretty straightforward. And this is what it currently looks like to create 
a job. Essentially, you define from where you're getting your data and to where you want to put your data. And as you can see, there are a bunch of fields uh, that you need to fill out. It's essentially what you'd have to fill out for Scoop 2. Uh, in the near future, we intend on improving that. We actually want to go one level up and make it really easy, really simple. Who knows, maybe all you have to do is drag and drop what table you want to use. Who knows? Um, and so that would be the end of this presentation. Any questions, comments, or concerns? If so, please direct them to yard sets. And I would be more than happy to answer them. Uh, we have a demo, so don't end us. Uh, in the case that there won't be any further questions, there is one. So when you're moving the data from your uh, relational database management mm -hmm. systems into Hadoop, how do you hold all these objects in memory? Do you do any special optimization on this? So uh, I don't have to repeat the question, right? It will be on the, uh, on the recording. Cool. So um, the, it actually depends on the connector. Uh, it's up to the connector how to get the data from, uh, from database. A um, couple of examples, generic JDBC connector will open a JDBC connection, will do select query to get the data, right? Uh, MySQL down for, or differently, uh, we have a special connector for MySQL, a direct one that can take advantage of a MySQL dump utility that will, you know, run a different process to get the data differently. You can think about different approaches, you know, uh, how, to get, how to get the data. Uh, now on that picture, or actually, can we actually scroll up? Yeah, go for it. Did that yeah. help? On the workflow picture, I'm sorry. Um, you, you have a, you know different extractors and different loader phase, right? And the question has been, how are you representing all the data into memory, right? So the first important thing is, it's a streaming. It's not that I am materializing the entire table in a memory and once in a, the extractor phase, then moving to the loader and storing it finally, right? I am just loading a couple of rows, some batch, through the extractor, passing it to the loader, and finally putting it to the final destination. The in-memory representation actually depends on the connector. The connector is saying that's the representation that is most fast for me. That's how I can interact in the you know, most efficient speed. Uh, for the MySQL dump, it probably will be text, right? Because MySQL dump will get text from the database. Some other connectors can use you know, a different binary representation. At this point, I don't really care. And it's up to the loader, uh, loader uh, to actually serialize the data based on what the user set. I mean, if I want to transfer data to text, I will do the conversion there. If I want to import data to HBase, then I have to you know, convert them to a put statements and put into HBase. Did that answer the question? So you're saying that everything, you just get everything out as text and then you're just relating, relying on the loaders to translate everything to whatever is needed, right? uh, Text is a one format, very common for at, you know, uh, at least the fast export tools uh, from a database perspective, such as MySQL, PGDAM, or a fast export on Teradata case. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make uh, is that we, as a developer for Scoop, really don't care. It's up to the connector, but it's his native interface. Oh, okay. I so see. it can be bytes, it can be, I don't know, Avro, Parquet. It can be my own proprietary format. All I need to do is just uh, on the loader phase to say, either give me the row as a logical representation, give me a text, somehow get it in a format that I understand. But as, as long as the extractor phase is concerned, Anything that you can work with, I don't really care. Okay, thank you. And you have much more. C c can you wait? Does it support uh, incremental data transfers as well from the DB? So definitely, right? Uh, we will add uh, uh, incremental support because that's one of the major use cases, right? Uh, I believe I mentioned it. Uh, when we firstly worked on Scoop, it was like, yeah, we just need to get the data once. We don't really care. We will type command, every fill will be fine. Uh, but what, our, what we've seen our users actually doing is really like, hey, I am having a hourly partitions, and as long as the hour is done, I need to transfer the data because you know, the rest of my business depends on it. 
So incremental imports, very, very important and will be there. Right now, the, I will finish the question. Uh, the scoop uh, two is, I would say, a very yearly phase of the development. So the incremental imports are not there, uh, but we will add them very shortly. Uh, it's you know one of the major major features. But that depends on the partitions being available and they being available in different partitions. But what happens to the data which keeps getting updated? That wouldn't be taken care by incremental. But very 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 good question. So. Uh, you have a different ways how to describe the incremental import, right? Uh, I will actually go into scoop one because that's where actually all the things are already working. And in scoop one, we have two ways how to define incremental import. Uh, the first way is so-called append mode. Uh, you have some column, primary ID, you know, uh, incremental based plus one plus one. And what scoop does, it say, hey, what was the last ID that I've transferred? that can be either set by a user or stored inside its own repository, right? That's why we have the first repository. And every time you have a table that you will fill, Scoop will transport some data, and as you will continue importing data, uh, the next time you will run Scoop, Scoop will realize here is when I end it, and I will transfer the rest. But this is assuming that the data are immutable, right? Because if I have a table that I transfer here, and hey, by the way, I've changed this row, it will never get imported again, right? A huge problem. So the second way how to transfer data is so-called last updated. Uh, the scoop is, you know, the magic really disappeared on this board, and I feel sorry for that. But we need to have a way how to know what rows has changed. So the second way is to say, hey, keep updated some column. Let's call it last update date. I don't really care about the name. The semantics of that column is, that's where I lastly changed that row. And then I can run a query, right? Last time, I run today, right now. Give me all rows that has been inserted or changed after this time. I will import them to HDFS or into HBase. Then I can merge them with the previous data set, you know, based on the primary keys, and finally uh, end up in the final, final stage. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Uh, but, uh, uh at the destination, at the target, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the incremental data transfer, it will just have the incremental data if you uh, choose a different location every hour or every day, right? Is it possible to support uh, a snapshot of the data on the Hadoop cluster, but you would still end up transferring uh, only the incremental data? So, uh, Scoop right now uh, will always work with the one directory for the target. Okay. I can imagine that you can do a hard level logic on top of that using Scoop as you know, the way of transferring data. But right now the Scoop doesn't have a built-in support for this particular use case. I would, however, encourage you to go to Apache Jira and file a request for it. Uh, Apaches are welcome. Thank you very much. Another quick question. Uh, why would you need a reducer uh, mm -hmm. for the load phase? I was hoping that someone will ask. Um, actually, I don't. Uh, and if you will just run the scoop, uh, it will be scoop only, uh, sorry, scoop only. Uh, it will be map only job. We are not using reducers by default. Um, the reason why I do have the loader on the reducer side is that in scoop two, you have the ability to force scoop to put the loader into a separate, uh, separate stage. What is the reasoning for it? And that is the question, right? Uh, well, right now, not a big reasoning, right? Because I'm just storing data to HDFS. Uh, when there will be an H base, you might want to limit the number of connections going to your H base, right? And the number of connections for the database might be different, right? So now you need two stages with two d different number of tasks. Another use case is that in the, after we will add the transformation phase, that in this case would be really on the reducer side, you want to limit the number of concurrent uh, transformations, right? Uh, why? You might be using some remote resources and again, you don't want to overload them. So to summarize it, right now it's map only job. Uh, the reducer there is for a future. Uh, I had a question on transformation. Mm -hmm. um, so you're planning, uh, are you planning a way to convert from text or uh, the proprietary DB mm -hmm. um, storage format into something like, yeah. I don't know, I, I see RC question. file or something of that sort? 
so uh, I guess from this perspective, you, ha you can think about two different transformations. Uh, data transformation, like a format, right? On the input, I have some proprietary format. On the output, I have RC file, Avro. That's, I would say, opaque to you as a user. That's more a scoop internal implementation, right? You will configure, hey, I want my data as a parquet file, and scoop will do that for you. The transformation phase that we are talking about uh, is more for you as a user, right? Um, I'm thinking about an example. Uh, imagine that you are having a data in the database, and on the Hadoop, you need to multiply them by 100. Why, I don't know, you're storing in the database number of seconds and you need to store number of milliseconds, or you need to you know, multiply by 100. Those are the transformations. Um, you can ask, hey, all those transformations, I can have done them on the database side, right? I can change my query to say, yeah, give me that column, multiply by 100, right? But then you will start thinking, I have one database and I have one, you know, um, one Hadoop cluster, but I have 16 cores on the, on the, on the database and 200 cores on the Hadoop, right, where you want to put the load. Uh, similarly, what we actually seen in the past, uh, some of the users that we've seen are doing a <laughs> shenanigans when selecting rows, you know, a where statement with five different rows, doing a huge, huge logic that is putting a lot of load in the database. So another reason for the transformation phase is to do sort of a filtering where you can say this row, I don't really want to import it. Um, another use case for the transformations uh, in financial industry, uh, on the source, you can have a credit card data, right? You can have the credit card number. You might want to import it as a, you know, asterisk and just keeping the last four digit or something like that. Um, so I have uh, two questions. Um, the first one um, regarding the export from the database tables. Um, <laughs> to, um, what happens in case if uh, some tables related um, one with, with other, so have one to many or many to many relations with foreign keys? Do you have, so do you have some semantic to apply that? Or so connector just um, export a, a table independently? Excellent question. Um, it actually depends. Um, in the most naive case, uh, you can specify, let's say that you have, you know, a fact table, sorry, uh, what is it called? Fact table and two dictionary tables, right? That's what you're describing. Uh, in the most naive case, you can say, hey, import three tables and join them on Hadoop later. Dep you might want to need to do it, you might not. Uh, or you can join them. Uh, in Scoop, I know that we were just talking about an example, I have a table, but that's just the you know, most, I would say, easier use case. In Scoop, you actually can say, hey, here is my query, a result set that I want to import. And in that query, you can specify any arbitrary joins. And the query I uh, can configure some, somehow in the connectors? Or? Yes. Was the question? Yeah, uh, then and again, it depends on the connector. What ex exactly is uh, supported? Mm. Uh, the generic JDBC connector allows you to submit any arbitrary query. And the second question, just a curious. Uh, so you uh, talked about uh, SQL and no SQL database. Um, if I have my data um, somewhere in messaging system or mm -hmm. in FTP, is it any plans to support mm -hmm. it? Um, so I just, just thinking perhaps a camel could be a good um, way so to implement a connector. That is a second question that I hope somebody will, uh, will ask me. Thank you very much. So uh, in Scoop 1, we were basically forcing everyone to follow the JDBC model. We were expecting that every connector will know about JDBC connection, about username, password, blah, blah, blah. And we actually had problem with that. Guess what? CouchDB doesn't have the concept of table. So, you know, we forced them, hey, give me a table parameter even though it's unused. Uh, that's why we did a lot of the changes that I talk about when the parameters are exposed by the connectors and blah, blah, blah. The connect or the connector themselves, they can, you know, can expose anything and transfer data from anywhere. We don't really care. Uh, the reason why we imported or uh, designed it this way, that we are actually planning to add a non-relational sources. Um, for example, source for a mainframe, or source for FTP, or source for, yeah, I don't know, anything else. So yes, you can do it. 
there is one thing that I actually want to add. Uh, scoop in a nature is a batch system. So loading data from FTP, very good use case. Loading data stored on mainframe, very good use case. Loading data from JMS, not so much. JMS is a real-time you know, queuing system, right? But guess what? We have a different component, core Flume, that is meant for a real-time uh, data access. And actually, I can promise you that right now the Flume does support JMS. So it's just a different use case. Would you mind ask the question to the microphone? So do you, do you think in order to, to reuse some connector from camera, for example, they have a, a strong, uh, they have already a um, uh, big, big, big bend of the connectors. So mm -hmm. it's, it basically, it's not necessary to rewrite uh, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that I've understood the question. Uh, reuse camera projects, you use Apache camera oh. as a connector. I'm not familiar with camera, so I can't really comment, I'm sorry. But if it's just some sort of storage, you know, we, I'm sure that we can create a connector for it. Or actually you can if you want to. So how will you limit the number of connections from extractor to the DB? If there are 200 extractors, if all of them make simultaneous connections. Then the database will die, right? Yes. <laughs> so uh, so, so um, the, uh, it's actually user responsibility. Uh, one of the reasons why we've introduced a central component, Scoop to Server, is to do resource management. Um, in Scoop 1, uh, you know, you had the ability to say, hey, use only 50 connections, use only 10 connections, use only 5 connections. But Scoop 1 has been a command line utility, right? I have user there, I have user there. So, you know, an example that actually happened to me, I knew that I can run, in order to run uh, a data transfer and not put a, a lot of burden on the database, I knew that I can run 10 connections. At the same time, transfer data, production traffic unaffected. So, you know, one day I've decided to do it, transport the data, but guess what was? My friend from Russia had exactly the same idea at the same time. We had 20 connections at the same time and the production traffic has been affected. So uh, in Scoop 2, uh, when you're creating the connection object, part of that is to say, I want to allow maximally 20 connections on this database. And then Scoop server can do the resource management, uh, can say, hey, you want to start a job with 10, map, 10 connections? I'm sorry, I cannot really allow that because I don't have them available. Uh, is this scoop just for uh, JDBC or are there any initiatives to do uh, able to MongoDB, for example, or another da uh, data source? So uh, scoop 2 is open to anything. Uh, we made a lot of changes to allow basically any arbitrary source in more a batch mode. Scoop is not really a real-time uh, real-time uh, real tool. Uh, specifically for the MongoDB, I, no, we have a connector for CouchDB. We don't have a connector for MongoDB yet, uh, but the cost of writing one is relatively cheap. Any other questions? We're interested in using Apache Kafka um, mm -hmm. as our message bus. So I'm just wondering if you guys have any kind of um, ideas with regards to implementing uh, a connector of sorts for Apache Kafka. Mm -hmm. It would be more along the lines of Flume, but at the same time, Apache uh, Kafka could potentially be storing weeks worth of logs you would want to initially import mm -hmm. before handing off to Flume for the real-time stuff. So uh, my personal thoughts, just me personally, I do see a Kafka in the more real-time use. Uh, so, you know, I don't see immediately creating a scoop connector for Kafka, but you're correct, right? You can be representing their weeks of data and you might want to pull them at the same time. So yes, I can imagine such connector. Have, am I correctly working on one? No. I think we can take one last question. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thanks.